Welcome to the chemistry workbook. This is uh, the explanation part one. So we're going to be talking about uh, ionic compounds to start off with. And if you recall, ionic compounds uh, are generally things that come from one side of the periodic table. Um, these metals over here. The metals are all of this stuff here. But we're going to look first uh, at these ones in the first columns, we've got lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on, um, or beryllium, magnesium, calcium. Let's say those two, you, you probably remember learning that uh, they're try they've got either one or two extra electrons in their outside or valence shell. And so what they're trying to do is get rid of those, and by doing so, they end up over behaving more like this column here, which is the noble gases. So these are ones with full valence shells or full outer shells. So they're trying to get rid of one electron or two electrons. Over on this side, we've got the ones, uh, these nonmetals over here, like fluorine, chlorine, uh, and bromine, let's say, in this first column. They're going to want to pick up an extra electron, gain one electron, and uh, end up more like this column here. So they're going to end up gaining an electron, and that's going to make them negative. And so we'll think of these as negative 1 all the way down here. Same thing goes with this column. They're going to generally try to gain two electrons, minus 2. And in this column here, minus 3. Let's just go with the top ones for now. Okay, So these are going to try and go one step over, gain an electron, and, and become negative by 1. These become negative by 2 and negative by 3, nitrogen and phosphorus over here. Okay. Over here, this whole section, we're going to consider them to all become plus 1. Plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, etc. These ones will all be... plus 2. And so the ion versions of these things will say, if we have a beryllium ion, that would be beryllium 2 plus. Because it's given away two negative things, two electrons, to become more like uh, helium. Uh, and if we have a fluorine ion, it's going to be fluorine 1 minus or usually we just show it as minus, if it's just one, we would leave out the one. But fluorine, let's think about, I'm going to put the digits in for now, just so we see them clearly. So fluorine would become a fluorine one minus, or minus one, because it's picked up an electron, which is negative, and made it closer to neon. All right, so these, once they've given that electron away, or picked up that new electron, these are called ions. All right. Um, and so an, an ionic bond is when two of these uh, metals, a metal and a non-metal, make a deal basically to, um, to balance each other's electrons out, basically. So let's say uh, lithium. And fluorine. All right, those are Li and F. So Li here is going to become a 1 plus. It's going to get rid of one electron. Fluorine is going to become a 1 minus. All right. The resulting thing is going to be Li. They go together like that, L, I, F, right after each other. That's why the second letter of these things is always a lowercase, so you can tell we've got a new thing uh, if you have a capital letter. So lithium and fluor fluorine. This would be called lithium fluoride. So lithium fluoride is lithium and fluorine, and because they are both one and one, they balance each other out. 
So lithium fluoride, the formula for it would be LIF. So if you think of it as, let's say, lithium and fluorine, lithium has one electron extra, fluorine is trying to get one electron extra, so they're going to balance each other out, that's going to go to that spot, and then they're equal. All right. Or if you want to go even simpler, Li is looking to make one connection, F is making to ma looking to make one connection, and they can just connect like that. So one and one will work out. Now, why do we bring this up? Why do we bring up these numbers? Well, what if we have beryllium? Beryllium is going to have two electrons that it wants to get rid of. And let's say fluorine has one electron that it wants to gain. Well, we've got two little guys here and only one here. So we need another fluorine to make that work out. Okay, Not very sophisticated looking, but that's kind of how it works out. Two fluorines and one beryllium will make a beryllium fluoride. So beryllium fluoride would have a formula of BE for beryllium and F. We need two of them. When we're inside, oh, once we're naming our compound like this, the BE and F go together, so we have to put small numbers below to say that there's two of them. So it's beryllium fluoride, BEF2. That means that there's two fluorines and one beryllium. All right, so I'm going to put that down here for a second, BEF2 as beryllium fluoride. And I'm going to do a different way to show how to figure this out. It's called the crossover rule. And if you're looking at your package, you'll see this uh, on the bottom of page one, the crossover rule. It's a little bit of a shortcut. And it just says, OK, well, I've got beryllium. Here's beryllium fluoride. OK? So someone poses a question. Beryllium fluoride, what's the formula for it? Well, you look at the name beryllium, and it's BE. You look at fluorine. You take fluoride, you turn it into fluorine, and that is F. Okay, so those are going to be your letters, your symbols you're going to use. Now you look at the charges. Okay, what is an ion going to be like? It's going to have a 2 plus here. Fluorine is going to be a 1 minus. Okay, and you write those up on the top like that. That's what their ions would look like. And then you just take the number that's up here and put it down here, and the number that's up here and put it down here. That's the crossover part. So now we have BE1 and F2. BE1, F2, but whenever it's only one, we don't put a one. We just put BE, because BE counts as one. And then F2. And that's your formula for beryllium fluoride, and it checks out. So, let's try another one. On the first page, we have calcium phosphide. Exercise one, number one. Calcium phosphide. Okay, so calcium is here. Phosphorus. So phosphide is phosphorus, and that's going to be a 3 minus, so that's P. So 2 plus for calcium, 3 minus. 
for, uh, sorry, 2 plus for calcium, 3 minus for phosphorus. Calcium, 2 plus. Phosphorus is 3 columns over, so it's 3 minus. Crossover rule, 2 and 3, bring the 2 down here, 3 over here. Your formula for calcium phosphide is Ca3. The important thing about ionic compounds is, well, there's a lot of important things, but one of them is, um, let's think about the formula for uh, glucose. We've heard of glucose and it's C6H12O6. Well, C6H12O6 t tells you um, that these, this combination of atoms is arranged. It doesn't really tell you you have to know how they're shaped, but um, there's a whole organization of them. There's actually a big structure with six carbons placed around, six oxygens placed around in a certain place, and 12 hydrogens, and they're all mixed up, and they're all in different places, but they're specific places. All right? So a molecule of glucose actually has six things, H thing, 12 things, six things. But that is a molecular or covalent compound. It's all made of non-metals. Uh, we consider in this case hydrogen to be a non-metal in, uh, in this situation here. So uh, C, H, and O are all non-metals that are going to be participating in this big molecule. So we say actually 6, 12, and 6 for glucose, for a molecular or covalent compound. But when we're dealing with an ionic compound, it's just a collection of lithiums, say, and fluorines, and we're trying to figure out how many have to join with each other to make it work out. And sometimes it's going to be one lithium and one fluorine, sometimes it's going to be um, one beryllium and two fluorine, but we want to find the lowest number of each of them. It's like a fraction, we want to break it down to its lowest terms. So, with C6H12O6, if we did that, we could say, bring this down to CH2O. But we wouldn't do that with this chemical, this, with this compound. A covalent compound actually has these 6, 12, and 6. But with an ionic compound, If it ended up being something like, uh, well, I'm just going to make, make something up for a second here. If it was uh, um, something 6 and something um, 3, let's say x something and y 6 and 3, we would lower that down to x 2 y 1 take our numbers and divide them down until they're as low as they can go. So this would just be x to y. I'm going to do it with, with a real thing here. Um, I'm going to throw us ahead just for a second here. Uh, Pb, which is lead, can sometimes be 4 plus. We'll go into later what it can also be, but don't worry about that. So lead, sulfide. Lead sulfide, there's your S. So here's lead. Lead is um, <laughs> there it is, 82. Okay, so there's your lead. So it's, in this case, it's 4 plus, and sulfur, sulfur is 2 minus. 
Now, according to our crossover rule, we should take those and go 4 and 2. Right? That means that lead sulfide should be PB S4. Right? And if it were a molecular or covalent compound, we would do that because it's actually two leads and four sulfurs. But in this case, because it's an ionic compound, we want to lower those numbers as much as we can. And two divides into four, so we would say it's actually PB1S2. And we wouldn't write the one, we'd just say PBS. Now, I'm putting a little asterisk here because later on I'm going to explain you got to do a little extra on this one, but for now it would be PBS2 instead of PB2S4. Still with me? Computer just fell asleep. Okay. So that's the crossover rule and also the reducing our numbers down as low as we can go rule for ionic compounds. So anytime you can divide those down into a lower fraction, you got to do it. Uh, I'm just going to show you quickly using my beautiful diagram from before. PB and S. This one has it was 4 plus, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, and S, 2. Now, we could have uh, PB, 2, and S, 4. And they'd all, all these little guys would, would match up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. True, but actually, if you take a look at this combination, you see that we've kind of got two of these things, PBS2 and another PBS2. So really, this PB2S4 is actually two PBS2. And so we just get rid of one of them, and there you go, PBS2. Those two that the, that the sulfur needs, you get two of those, and four that the, that the, uh, that the lead wants to get rid of, and it, and it matches up. Okay, so there you go. PB2S4 and PBS2 are the same thing. And so we do the lower one, whenever possible. All right. Um, one that I should point out, a special one, is aluminum here. Aluminum is always 3 plus. All right, three, this whole chunk here, we can just chop out for a second and then jump right over to this is the three column. This is the four column here, but these don't really participate much, uh, at least in this area. Down here, they get, that's why you're, we've got sort of your lead can be both a two plus, but it's also got another one, which we're going to talk about right now. So here we go. So these ones are always one, always two. Aluminum, always three. But when we get into this territory here, all these metals, some of them have chosen one way that they're always going to be, one number of, uh, one ionic number. And some can have two different, and sometimes even more, different forms. So, um, now, if you take a look at page 3 in this booklet, you'll see a little paragraph here. Some transition metals, these are these ones here, uh, have only one charge, but you cannot tell easily from the periodic table. So we have zinc. Let's find those, and then take your, t take your periodic table and label them as such. So aluminum is always 3+. plus. Zinc is always 2+. plus. So here's 2+. Plus. 
and silver is always 1 plus. All right, so it's not easy to tell that that's going to be the case, but there we go. 3 plus, 2 plus, and 1 plus all the time. However, there are a number of one a number that uh, can have two forms. So the next little paragraph talks about those. For example, copper. Copper is right here. Copper can be 1 plus or 2 plus. So what we need is some way to tell which one we're using. Which one is it? Is it plus one or plus two? I'm going to take a step back for a second and we're going to uh, make a, uh, the name of a compound from the formula. So if we had KCl, potassium and chlorine. So you see potassium here, and chlorine, and then it's chlorine, so we turn it into ide, chloride. Just one back there, you have to always remember to turn oxide, oxygen into oxide, not oxygenide, that's written down there as well. But potassium chloride, because potassium is always one, and chlorine is always one, that's, that's it, it's done. We know that the formula is going to be one potassium, one chlorine, because we know what their charges are. And in this case, it's just potassium chloride. But what if we have copper and chlorine? Now, copper and chlorine can combine in two ways. If copper is one plus, then we have copper and chlorine that way, okay, because copper is 1 plus, and chlorine is 1 minus, and so they match up. So CuCl would be one possible way, and if it's 2 plus, then it would be CuCl2, because copper has 2 plus, and chlorine has 1 minus, so we do our crossover rule, we'd end up with 1 down here and 2 over here. So these are two different possibilities for combinations of copper and chlorine. All right, this would be copper chloride. This would also be copper chloride. So which one, how do we know from the name what they're going to be? All right, so I'm going to write copper chloride on this one and copper chloride on this one. So which one's which? Which, what has copper gone with? Has it gone with 1 plus or 2 plus? The way we figure it out for our name is we put a number here. We put a number here. If it's 1, then we put a 1. If it's 2 plus, we put a 2. Kind of. But soak that in for a second. We have a name. We say copper 1 chloride or copper 2 chloride. And that number in the middle tells us what the charge of the first thing is. Is it copper 1 plus or is it copper 2 plus? Because that's going to tell us how many chlorines we need. Now, if it was that simple, we'd be done. And it's almost that simple, except somewhere along the way it was decided instead of using regular numbers, Arabic numbers, we would use Roman numerals instead. Not sure how that decision was made, but 1 is 1, 2 is 2, 3 is 3. That's, you don't have to know too many more than that. 4, I'll just keep going on. IV, 5 is V, 6 is VI. 
It's rare that you're going to have five or six, but there are four, three, twos, and ones that are fairly common. So we use these Roman numerals and we plop them in here. So instead of one, the Arabic numeral, we're going to put copper one chloride. Instead of copper two chloride like this, we're going to put copper two chloride like that. And that is how you can tell by the name of one of these compounds how many of each atom you have, and so therefore what your formula is. This is called multivalent elements. The multivalent part is the copper having different options. So multivalent means copper can be 1 plus or 2 plus. So if you take a look at this sheet, you'll see some examples of these. Copper can be copper 1 plus or 2 plus. Mercury can be Hg 1 plus or 2 plus. Uh, there's a, at the end, there's antimony, Sb, can be 3 plus and 5 plus. So there's an occasion where you might need a, a, a V. Now you might ask, well, what about if um, the negative ones have multiple options? Well, luckily, they don't. They're all either minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So I'm going to direct your attention to the back of your periodic table now. So here's your periodic table. Okay. And on the back, in this corner here, we will see multivalent metals. And there's Cu for copper, and it's plus 1 and plus 2 or 1 plus and 2 plus. So those are ones that have different options, and the most common ones are shown in bold. So usually copper is going to be 2 plus. Usually mercury is going to be 2 plus Hg. Gold Au is usually going to be 3 plus. But it's got two options. They all have two options. Um, down at the bottom, we have other metals. So there's your aluminum, zinc, and silver. Aluminum, zinc, and silver, which are always 3 plus, 2 plus, and 1 plus. And that's how all that works. So we'll just do a couple of examples and then we'll wrap for today. So exercise two. We have A is cobalt two chloride. cobalt 2 chloride. So we look on our periodic table for cobalt. Cobalt right here is CO and chloride is CL. The 2 again tells us that it is 2 plus. That's the charge of cobalt in this case. So we put 2 plus up here and if you take a look at the back of your periodic table, you'll see uh, cobalt is there, and it's 2 plus or 3 plus. Those are two options for it, so it works. Chlorine, 1 minus. Crossover rule, 1 and 2. So the formula for cobalt 2 chloride is COCl2. Okay, so here's a question. What if you were given a formula, COCl2? What would you call it? So here's what you do, and you can run into some trouble on this kind of question. So, um, so if you're given the formula and you need to find the name, here's what you do. Well. You do the reverse crossover rule first. So we're going to take our numbers, we're going to say, well, that's 1 down there, and 2. We're going to put our 1 up here, 
going to put our 2 up here. Okay, that's step 1. That's going to tell us the charge on cobalt. But we have to check one thing very carefully. We have to look at our second thing and say, is this true? Is chlorine minus 1? If it is, then that means that this is true. I'll give you an example where it's not the case. All right. So since that is true, we would say cobalt chloride. And we'd say it's cobalt 2 chloride, which we know from the beginning of the question. But this is how you would figure it out in reverse. So cobalt 2 chloride, you figure it out by doing the crossover rule backwards and then checking to see if this is true. So let's try a different one and see where we can run into problems. CO, o. cobalt, oxide. All right, so we're given this, and we're asked, what's the name of this compound? So we look at our periodic table, say, okay, well, CO is cobalt, and O is oxide. Now, I want you to start getting used to the idea that some of these things, when you see them right away, sodium, sodium, you should say, ah, I know that's in one, so I don't have to add anything here. Potassium, always one. You don't have to leave room in here. But cobalt is something from the back of the page, something from in here that has multiple options. And if that's the case, you need to leave room here because you're going to have to specify what the charge is using one of these numbers. So we're leaving cobalt and oxide, and we have one of each. So what I said was, we put down how many there are. We do the reverse crossover rule. Sorry, plus. So we've got the one up here and the one over here. All right. Does that mean this is cobalt one oxide? No. Why not? It should be because cobalt one, that's the charge on cobalt. So we put one here. But you have to check that your negative one, your negative ion, has the right number. And in this case, oxygen should be 2. Oxygen needs to be 2, so we have to multiply this to get it to be 2, and that means you also have to multiply this to get it to be 2 also. All right, You have to turn this charge correct and then multiply this one accordingly. Okay, so this charge would be cobalt 2, cobalt 2 oxide. And this actually is the, the, um, the bringing the things down to lowest terms in reverse. If we were given the question, what's cobalt 2 oxide, we'd say, well, it's CO, O, cobalt 2, that means it's 2. And oxygen, we know from over here, is always 2 minus. So we have 2 and 2. We bring this down, 2. Bring this down, 2. We'd say, well, it's CO2, O2. But since they're the same number, we bring them down to 1. So it's just CO, O, which is what we started with. So these kinds of things, sometimes you'll be given a name and have to turn it into a formula, and sometimes you'll be given a formula and have to turn it into a name. 
So it's important that you understand how to do that to get the right subscripts if you're making a formula and the right name, including the charge, if it is one of these special metals in this area here. And that's part one.